I think it's live. Hello, everybody. It's Lee, and um, with this is Legal Advice. And I want to talk to you about narcissism today with our special guest expert, Susan Ball. And this is my co-host, Allison Reiner. And Allison's platform is about love. Allison, why don't you introduce yourself, and then we'll introduce Susan. Perfect. This is not legal advice. <laughs> it's, right. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Alison Ryan. I'm a loved again and forever coach. And that means I, I work with women who are questioning whether they want to stay married or not. And uh, you know, together we, we take a journey inwards and come to, to whatever conclusion you want. And then we, we create a, a path towards your, your vision, towards your, your final outcome, if you like. So that's a little bit about me. I'll talk a bit more about me as we go on through the, the interview. But over to you, Susan. Tell us a bit about you. What do you do? Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I am a women's freedom coach and self-love activist. And I work with women who are in ugly, toxic, abusive relationships to help them see that and to get clear about leaving and rebuilding themselves and their lives and really jacking up their personal value so that it doesn't happen to them again. Yeah. And, and I um, am a divorce lawyer and the creator of Project Positive Change. And um, I started This Is Not Legal Advice because I give so much uh, advice in my office that's not legal advice. And I always have a little preface so they know, one, that they're off the clock. I'm not charging them for all of my um, colloquialisms or whatever. And two, that this is not something they ha that I'm advising them to do. This is just something that me as a person is telling them that I think, right? And one of the things that comes up actually a pretty good bit is narcissism. And um, I have an, my own narcissism story and I didn't really know what it was. And I had a date with a guy and on our first day, I said to him, um, hey, what would your ex-wife say about you? And he said that I'm an arrogant, egotistical narcissist. And silly me said, when are we going to go out on our second date? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but I didn't say that, but I did continue to date him until, you know, it, it turned into the, the typical narcissistic relationship. And, um, and then, and now I know what it is, but Susan, for anybody who doesn't know, like I was at Caesar's Palace just, just this past weekend in Vegas and they have a reflecting pool. And I said, oh, this is where Narciss Narcissus fell and, you know, saw his reflection or whatever. So for those of us who don't know what narcissism is, because I, I didn't know, you know, I thought, oh, he thinks a lot of himself. But I didn't really realize how dangerous and how distressing it can be to be involved with somebody who's got a narcissistic personality disorder or is, has narcissistic tendencies. So Susan, just tell us what that is. It, a little bit about it. It's it's someone who loves themselves so much, their words, their opinion, their values, their views, that anything you do or say is of no consequence, no meaning, no value, and they will diminish everything you say. You personally, they will attack you on a physical level, a verbal level. They will attack you every way they can. They're also, interestingly, serial cheaters. Because they have to have a constant, constant, um, what's the word, uh, people looking up to them. Supply. and Supply, if you want to call it that. But it's also this ego, ego, um, what do you call it? Ego boosting that they have to have all the time. It's a constant need of theirs. So that's a narcissist. And they are sometimes easy to, to capture in the beginning. But usually the first sign of a narcissist is the guy who falls in love with you immediately. And it's so, you know, it feels so good to be loved, you know? And so when you're getting that attention and Allison, have you ever dealt with narcissists? I know you have. Um, <laughs> I know you have. And, and uh, tell us about your experience with narcissism, Allison. Well, mine is a little bit different um, because it's not to do with a romantic relationship. My narcissism story is my is the relationship I had with my mother. And as you say, Susan, it was so subtle that it kept me foxed for 45 years. Yeah, I what? really foxed. I really had no idea. I was completely in the dark to it. In fact, my mother was my, my heroine. I did everything to, to be just like her. 
I believed everything she said. I believed that she had the worst life ever, that my, my job in life was to make her life as good as possible, to put her needs first. I, you know, I'm not saying I didn't think about myself because outside of her, I did. But, you know, my, my whole focus with her was everything that she needed to be happy. And I didn't realise until I started working on myself, until I, until I started taking care of me and putting my needs, you know, first, that, uh, that she, that there was a problem because everyone else around about me sort of championed me. My husband jumped up and down and said, yes, I love you like this. And friends started saying, God, it's great to see the confidence in you. And my mom started pushing me and mm. pushing me and pushing me. And, you know, and every time I fought back, she would, she'd be nasty. She'd be rude. She'd cut me off. She, uh, she told other people lies about me and I couldn't understand it. But, you know, it, it became, and then again, I, I came in across somebody who used the word narcissist. I'd heard it before. And I, this time it just kind of clicked. So I went off to read about it and I thought, yeah. yeah, that's it. That is exactly it. That's how it's always been. But because it's one of those words, and I think that's the, the thing that you were alluding to, Lee, it's one of those words that we hear and it's so uh, often thrown about nowadays, but it's kind of lost its meaning. You know, anyone that treats us a little bit badly, any boyfriend that doesn't call exactly when he should call, anyone that doesn't turn up with flowers on a second date, we call them a narcissist. You know, I think they will show up with it, flowers the second day. In fact, <laughs> my narcissist sent me flowers on our second date. Oh, well, <laughs> on our second day, he sent me a bouquet of flowers. Oh, well, which case I'm wrong. <laughs> one of the things that they do really, really well is devalue you make you they're crazy makers they make you start to believe you're crazy like you were saying that you're do and you work 10 times harder than you should have to to make this person like you and value you and accept you and love you in the way that you want to be loved but they don't have it in them you're just kind of spinning in a hamster wheel so to speak and when you think you're making progress they push you back they push you back and you have no life of your own with a narcissist, none, because you get caught in the trap of wanting to please them. And it becomes 24 seven. I need to please him. I need to figure this out. I need to fix him. I need to help him. And you lose sight of you. Yeah. yeah. And so if so, there's a couple of different um, pieces to this, because first there's that charming. And and so, you know, for we so Alison's talking about her mom, obviously female. Uh, Susan and I are talking about men, but narcissists c come in both sex, uh, yep. both sexes, they come in both sex, both sexes. And so, you know, if you're in a narcissistic relationship um, and you're down the road a little bit, <laughs> you know, like first it's that super charming, right? That um, super charming, well, what are, what are some other things? Charming, fall in love with you. What are some <laughs> other things that, that kind of hook you, Susan? Well, in my relationship that ultimately turned violent and I had to run for my life, started with the classic symptoms, the love, like I just thought he loved me right from the beginning. And of course, there's um, holding on to you everywhere you go. They're attached to you in some way, moving you through crowds, doing this stuff. And you think it's because they love you and want to protect you and so on and so forth. The next thing he did was isolation. Now, that's a big huge thing for narcissists they have to get you away especially in a romantic relationship from friends and family because they can't have outside influences so I was a single mom with two little girls and I came home from work one day and he said I lived in Toronto and he said I bought us a house so the girls can have a backyard and bikes and freedom out two and a half hours away from Toronto wow without and, uh, discussing it with you yeah well, because, uh, you know, having giving me a house for my children was like the biggest gift. And that's the trick. When you come back up out at them, this is the next thing they do. They start to get all, they internalize and say, how can you be mean to me? I was just doing something nice for you. Why are you yelling at me? I'm the good one here. I bought you a house. So then you think to yourself, oh, crap. <laughs> You know, yeah. like he was a really nice person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Then you start to feel bad. Then you try to justify their behavior and find fault with yourself. It's exactly that part. And you feel uh, so guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel yeah. so guilty for questioning their motives and yeah. questioning the spirit in which they did this. And then you feel ashamed that you even thought that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all nosy. <laughs> yeah. We'll be there. 
It's just amazing. So sad. It's, it's really, I mean, the thing is, is that I didn't realize until after so my father had died and, and I had asked the guy I was dating to just give me some, some time and space away from the relationship because he was very, at the first, he was so into me. He, he would text me every every hour practically and be like, sorry, you haven't heard from me. And I was like, what do you mean? You just text me an hour ago, you know, constantly telling me where he was, updating me on his day, asking, you know, really, really, really super into me. And then as the months went by, heard from him less, heard from him less, couldn't go to his house on the weekends, couldn't go to his house, never called me back. Never, not one time did he call me on the phone. Um, never would talk to me. If I called him, he wouldn't call me back. You know, he probably had a whole nother life, I'm thinking, but I didn't know because I, I didn't realize what was happening. And then my father died and I said, I just, you know, I just feel really emotional. And he said, um, I don't like to be jerked around. And I thought, what? And, <laughs> and I just like poured my heart out about, you know, my father dying and, and, and all the emotions I'd gone through. And, and he, his response was, you know, I don't like to be jerked around. And it was, and I thought, wait a minute, this is, this can't be normal. Um, and it seemed so polar opposite to the man he had, he had been pretending to be. And that was what he, I said, okay, this isn't right. And I don't even know why, but I started actually looking at narcissism and realizing that it was like a classic narcissistic relationship. I mean, it was absolutely 100% classic. And I hadn't seen it, you know, and, and I was fortunate enough that it was only four months in and I didn't get so firmly entrenched because they do really suck you in. Well, yeah, because after we moved out of town, then the next thing was to get me married to him that, and have a baby. These were all, and I didn't want any more children. I was having trouble with the two I had. I didn't want, <laughs> that was enough for me. But this was a big deal for him. But I recognized afterwards, that's how they really, really get you um, pinned down to them. Because if they get you to have a baby, you're more and more reliant on them. There's this question of taking away the father from the child. Yeah. So now you have guilt and shame associated with that. So this whole game that they play is very premeditated. It's There's very tons of guilt. Hmm? Tons of guilting. Tons of it. Tons of it. When I finally agreed to marry him, um, and fortunately for me, I did get out. But when I married him, I we were coming out of a very fancy hotel in Toronto after our wedding night. Coming up the ramp in out of the underground parking lot, and he grabbed my hand, and he squeezed it quite hard, and he said, "Now that you're my wife, you're going to do as you're told, how you're told, and when you're told." Wow! And I thought he was joking. I sort of went ha 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 ha, and things <laughs> just played. <laughs> oh, you know, I did. I was like, "Oh, that's so funny." He was like, "The joke's on her." <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> He's like, "Wait till you see what's coming now, honey, babe." So you know, the, it just escalated from there. So, so, that's charming. Really so, char so ultra charming. And also I found that suddenly he was interested in all the things I was interested in. You know, I was his soulmate and he was sending, oh, yeah. he was buying me gifts and everything that I did. Suddenly he was reading infinite possibilities, which is the work of Mike Dooley, which is, you know, I'm a trained startup, you know, suddenly he was listening to Deepak and Oprah and he was talking about, you know, the law of attraction he, he totally, I was like, this guy is my soulmate. So you've got that too soon, right? Too much too soon, right? So that's kind of the first thing that if you're in that relationship, when it seems too good to be true, sadly, it probably, it probably is. is. You know, that's, yep. that's unfortunate. But if it, you know, because um, I, I do believe in love and romance and all of those things. But when that person, so that's like the number one thing. And then the next stage, it seems like, is they start, as Susan said, they, and Allison, they start kind of twisting, um, twisting around some way and, and devaluing. So what are some examples, just in case, some, I mean, I think that's pretty obvious, devaluing, but what are some examples of de devaluation? Allison or Susan, anybody, which one? Um, for me, it's, it's that question, almost gaslighting if you like you know where where something seems so black and white it's so clear 
and they actually deny it. You know, it's there in front of you, it's undeniable and they deny it, but they deny it in such a way that you actually begin to question yourself and question what's, what's obvious. And, you know, but we all have that. And that's, that's something that I wanted to go on to because we all have that tendency to, uh, yeah, at some point or another. So there's the narcissist that's, uh, that Susan's talking about. And then there's also just bad behavior that we kind of fall into, you know, when we don't want to face up to something or when, you know, yeah, when things aren't going our way, we can all use that, that technique where we, we just deny. We deny what's happening around about us. So that's, that was something I wanted to ask you, Susan. How can you tell the difference? Because I see this a lot with my clients. They all come in like, I'm married to a narcissist. I need yeah. it out now. I hear it a lot. And I'm like, you know, um, <laughs> and then we start working on it. And it's not narcissism at all. It's nothing like narcissism. It's just bad behavior, bad patterns of, of communication, probably right from the very start. So how do you identify what's, you know, what the line is? I think that this word narcissism is getting thrown around way too much yeah. now. And women and men, some men, are using it as an excuse to justify their spouse's bad, just bad behavior or to justify their complaining about their uh, spouse's bad behavior. Yeah. So to me, to get to that, I, I ask them questions about the pattern. So if it's happening, oh, once a week, he goes off the rails, It's he gaslight too if you want to call it that it's just that one time and then he's good for a whole month and nothing else happens that's narcissistic he's not denying you the ability to go out with your friends he's not asking you to sit beside him on the couch every five minutes he goes to work and doesn't text you every five minutes where are you what are you doing you have to be home at a certain time not narcissism just a bad night at home yeah There's a difference. The key difference to them is when you're with a real narcissist, when you're in a narcissistically abusive relationship, you feel tense every moment of the day because you do not know what's going to happen. So when you're looking at your phone and you know he's coming home in five minutes, you start to escalate the stress. It's You don't know what mood he's going to come in. You don't know what he's going to accuse you of. You don't even know if he's going to come home. You get the kids to be quiet. You do all of these things because you want him not to react to anything. You want him just to have this perfect little. Yeah. So, but if you're not feeling that 24 seven, if you're not feeling you have to check in with this person all the time, if you're not feeling you have to be accountable to this person and you're not being put down because put downs are the big key to what they do. And some of them are vicious nasty put downs or you have nights where he just doesn't come home and feels he doesn't need to explain that to you you're not in a truly narcissistic relationship you're just in a bad relationship yeah and i think it, i would say that if there's a lot of give and take then it's not narcissistic because in a narcissistic relationship there's no give and take there's only no. take there's only yeah. you know there's only um and, and again i guess i mean i got really lucky even though i know that the guy i was dating was absolutely a narcissist and he actually had told me that his um mother had narcissistic personality disorder hello <laughs> I'm so naive i know i'm so yeah i'm so naive i had no i had no idea right um you know we didn't get to that point and actually he probably like i said had another whole relationship somewhere else but there's just you know there was it was always what he said was right um I mean, he would listen to me, but I was not right. You know, I was, he wouldn't concede that what I was saying was, I mean, it was like everything I said, he would twist around and, and it, until it was his viewpoint. So, you know, I would say in a relationship, if there's a give and take, um, that there's not, and he would put everybody else down. You know, he put down my friend. Oh, yeah. He would say that they're not, they're, they're using me or they're not this or they're that or they're, mm-hmm you shouldn't be around them because I think he wanted, you know, he wanted, he wanted to be the person that I always went to or listened to or whatever. So that's part of, that's part of the isolation pattern yeah. is they will start to make you believe that your friends and family are just real yeah. dirt bags. And like, he's the only thing that I can turn to. I'm just, I've just re- remem- <clears throat> remembered as you're talking, my, my sister years ago was in exactly that situation. I had, 
Yeah, uh, she was just slowly but surely removed from the family by this guy to the point that one day she just disappeared. <clears throat> and I literally searched the, comp- the country. Did you find her? Home. I eventually found her. I had to go in a car, help her climb through a second story window and run away. I mean, he had her locked in the house. It, wow. It, yeah. And <clears throat> when we met this guy, my poor sister, when we met this guy, we were like, well, he's not a great, you know, he's, he, let's hope she doesn't marry him. But, you know, he's not that bad. But he was in the background playing with her, playing with her, making her think that she wasn't loved at home, that she had nothing at home, that he was the only one that could look after her, that it was all about him. He would give her everything. We were, you know, we were trying to do her harm. And, you know, she was pulling away more and more and more to the point that she didn't have anywhere else to turn except him. So, of course, when he, when he offered to take her away to God knows where in the middle of nowhere, she had no choice but to say yes because she was so convinced that, that what she had back at home was, you know, was worthless and wasn't real and wasn't love and wasn't, you know, wasn't healthy. It was, it, yeah, it was pretty terrifying when I think back on it. I hadn't thought about that for years and years. That's horrible, but that's so classic because they do make you think that you aren't even capable of picking your friends or, yeah. or noticing these things. You're so stupid that you don't know what a good friend is. So you can't, you start questioning everybody you talk to. Oh, are they out to get me? <laughs> I don't want to be friends with you. I can't be friends with you. I'm not good at making friends, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, it was constantly, and, and you know, I will say that I've read that they re- that narcissistic personalities really love the empath, and they love the person who is caring and generous and kind, and, and you know, they play on that, because we we naturally want to make people feel good, and, and so he, I think that I was probably, you know, I just constantly tried to make him feel good, um, and he did that for me, too, until he got me. And then it was like, you know, then he started saying, um, you know, just making stuff up. And I was like, I didn't say that. I mean, I absolutely, I would say, what are you talking about? And I would ask my assistant Tiffany, I was like, you know, he said that I said this. I know I didn't say this. Because it makes you think you're crazy. You think you're crazy. I was like, what is he? Crazy makers. Yeah. (laughs) I would be like replaying it all in my head, trying to figure out how did that even yeah. How does it translate from what I said to his <laughs> understanding? Exactly. So, so I guess that's another way to spot the, you know, the crazy making or the, they can turn things around on you where you don't, where you're confused about your own, you know, opinion or your own ideas. You start questioning yourself. Um, and then when you, you guys both have mentioned danger. I mean, so Susan, do, do narcissistic relationships turn violent or is that a, is that kind of a, I guess it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. And a lot of them don't. A lot of them just stay in that sort of crazy making pattern where she becomes so um, weak, weak and unsure of herself and uncertain that she will never leave. So he has what he wants. He has exactly what he wants. And he can go and do whatever he wants because she's never going to uh, step up or, or, or vocalize what she wants or needs or whatnot. The ones who turn violent can uh, they they were violent in the beginning. Mm. Yeah, he, he was an abusive man to begin with, a physically abusive man to begin with. And but what I have noticed in the work that I've done with myself and with clients is those who are attracted to narcissists in, in that instant when they love you so much, there's something within us that is not fulfilled. Oh, I need to just put my head down. (laughs) For me, it was abandonment issues. So somebody comes along and they're big and strong and have blue eyes and they give you a big hug and they're going to take care of you. It was meltdown. It was, yeah, take me away. It's like, but until I healed that, I was still susceptible and vulnerable to that kind of behavior. Now I'm not, I, I would tell them to go pound salt. (laughs) <laughs> go do what oh you've never heard that expression no what did you say go pound salt i've never heard that expression what does that mean um it's a canadian expression from the salt mines and it's it's get a hammer and just repeatedly pound the salt because just go pound some salt 
<laughs> yeah, just, just go and do it. Like, to, yeah. Like, just... For some reason, it doesn't sound all that dismissive. It sounds like, I don't know. Yeah, no, it we want something off. strong. I'm going to say that today. But what, yeah. what you were saying, um, Susan, is exactly, and that's, you know, where you and I cross over in our work is, you know, what we do is we take women from that place of, you know, low self-worth, low self-esteem and, and build them into, you know, into that confidence, that self-confidence, not the overconfidence, but the self-confidence that knows right. what she deserves and, and is able to put the boundaries in place that stop people, you know, that make you unattractive to a narcissist apart from anything else. You know, if they spot that weakness in you. So what, tell us a little bit about what, how you work with women to build, you know, build that resilience up, that self-esteem up. The very first thing I tell my clients, and, and I want everybody to, to understand this message, confidence is not a mystery. Confidence has one thing. It is the memory of success. That's all it is. It's that simple. So I can feel uncom unconfident right now, no confidence, non-confident right now. If somebody said to me, if Allison said, hey, let's go jump out of an airplane, let's go parachuting. Well, my confidence would be at the bottom because it'd be like oh, I've never done that before and I would be totally fearful then we go I up promise I'm not good to do that mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> we go up in the airplane and jump out and it's a great success now where where's my confidence it's way up here so the next person who asked me to go jump out of an airplane I'm like yeah let's do this so I get my clients <laughs> start with yeah well it's true that's what confidence is everybody thinks confidence is a huge mystery thing it's just that it's an accumulation of success. That, that's, that makes sense. I like that. Yeah. So I start my clients right there. They start with success journals, not gratitude journals, success journals. Nice. Every small, little, I don't care how insignificant you might think it is. If you did it successfully, write it down and celebrate that. Give yourself a pat on the back and say, yeah, look at me. It doesn't matter if it's you went out past your curfew with your narcissist. That's a success. You face the music and you and you did that. Or you the big one is having the courage to leave. Celebrating that that is the biggest success you're going to have. The rest are going to be very small. Applying for the job, you applied for it, you got it, you did your resume. Celebrate that. Every time you celebrate your success, your confidence starts to come up. And then I get them to do 100 things they want in a man in a relationship it has to be 100 which all my clients look at me and they go 100 100 that sounds like a lot oh but then we break it down into the five that are absolutely non-negotiable and that's where you start to build boundaries yeah like mine would be must love dogs yeah yes. in fact they'll tell but the thing the narcissist will tell you whatever you want to hear yeah. because the, all they want to do is so, so the guy told me I would love to have a farm later I found out the, that he was like didn't want the dogs didn't because I have four dogs he didn't like the dogs you know he didn't want them around him because they had fur and all that <laughs> he was so, allergic to animals but he yeah, wanted the fur he looked, he's allergic to animals but he says I want a farm you know because I want a farm so it's you know but but yeah sorry to interrupt I got off on a tangent <laughs> that's okay it's okay it's but it's where you start to set boundaries so if you know what you want and Dogs. you know what you value in a relationship then you can see through some of these things and you start to heal and it has to be done you have to heal that child wound that thing from the past that is causing you to feel like swiss cheese and i always equate it with that that until you don't are talk old, to me about cheese <laughs> yeah. what when you mention cheese my ears <laughs> perk right up yeah, so me too. But don't, don't, be, I don't, have cheese. Cheese. <laughs> don't be like Swiss cheese. What does that mean? It means there's little holes in us that are not, we're not fulfilling on our own. Here I go. Here I go. Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> I want women to fulfill their lives on their own so that when they meet somebody, they're not looking for somebody to fill a gap or a hole in right. their their being they're already full their life is full they've got all of these things so what they're looking for is somebody to co-create with co-create other things so this stops all of those things from happening because you can kind of read through them and you go yeah no i don't love you in five minutes so it's you know it's not going to work also when you're fulfilled in your whole, you can walk away 
Which is why, Lee, you got, you know, within a very short time, you understood what was happening. You know, it, it wasn't, uh, you, you weren't right. six years into it. You've done all that work. That's so, right. yeah, it's very flattering at the beginning. Of course, it's flattering whether you, you know, yep. <laughs> no self-confidence at all or whether you're exuding self-confidence and your life's brimming over. If somebody shows that amount of attention, of course, you're drawn in. It's how quickly you see through it. So it's not, you know, we're all human. We like to be flattered. We like to be loved. That doesn't make us weak. It doesn't make us wrong. So, you know, it's it's how quickly you can say, ah, wait a minute. And that's where the intuition part is. And that was something that you talked about, for instance, right from the very beginning with this guy. There was always something that you couldn't quite put your finger on. And that's, you know, and we all have that. I'm sure, Susan, if you go back and you take yourself back to the very beginning of the relationship, there was something that you just didn't feel comfortable with that you pushed down, you ignored because actually he was giving you what you thought you needed. So, and that's That's such an important point because it actually in my book and in my work with clients, I talk very much about the conscious voice and the gut voice that we suppress all the time because our conscious voice is our should life. And we go through this, Oh, I should, I should, I should. And guilt and shame are all part of that. And we let that voice dictate what we're going to do instead of listening to this. Yeah. My daughter, when I married my massive abusively abusive husband, she cried that day and she pleaded with me not to marry him. Mm. Pleaded with me. And I thought she was just a little girl, but her intuition as a youngster was she li- kids listen to their in- intuition and their imagination much easier than we do. Life kind of gets in the way of that. If I had a really listened to her in my gut, it wouldn't have happened the way it did. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that if you don't, this is something somebody told me, and you know, and I not only is this not legal advice for me, it's not relationship advice because that's really not my forte at this point in my life. But um, is that if you don't feel good, if you're in a relationship and you always and you don't feel good, you know, then then it's not the right relationship, you know. You know, relationships are meant to feel good, to feel, to be fulfilling, to, to make you feel, to make you feel happier, not to make you feel doubtful or guilty or, you know, ashamed. And, and for me, um, you know, thank you, Allison, for saying that I, you know, I didn't let it go because he, he was trying to say, you know, how can you give up this relationship? This is a relationship uh, born of the ages. I mean, he sent me this three page long email, you know, just pouring his heart out. Please don't end this relationship. And ultimately, I was just like, I have to have some some time away from you and from this. And that's when he was like, don't jerk me around. Well, I'm like, what? What are you saying? You know, but before that, it was just this desk for all this, this, this email. And, and uh, my friends that read it were like, Lee, this is not even real. This is, this is just you know, it was so over the top. It was like, it was crazy. It was just, it was so over the top, you know? And, um, and so I did end it, but it was tough I though. Even, even after only four months, it really, it really did, you know, damage to me, even after, even in such a short time. And um, so I can't really imagine how people who have been in a narcissistic relationship for a long time, you know, it's- how they- just it's not I have women who come to me all the time and say I love him I really really love him and I say to them not necessarily you love the idea of him yeah yeah the idea of him the ideal of him him as he is right now probably not if we really broke it down but you love the idea that if you could fix him if you could fix all the broken pieces and you could make him into this great person that's what you love that doesn't exist yeah, that's ultimately what I had to tell myself is that the person that I met at the beginning who was so amazing was not the real person, you know, and um, yeah, a, a lady came in to see me a couple of weeks ago and she'd already been working with a therapist for a few years, but she said I was in a narcissistic relationship and she said that when she had her baby in the hospital, having the baby after she had the baby, the guy said, oh, I can't be on the birth certificate because I'm already, I'm still married to somebody else. And she was, and the nurse, can you imagine? Here's the nurse with the birth certificate. 
and here's the man that you that you're engaged to and suddenly tells you you're, he's married to somebody else but she stayed with him and she she ended up you know and this has been you know much later but she stayed in the relationship i mean and and she said she's been in therapy for a year and a half um and her child's like four or five now because she just she said it just broke her completely you know just so when i Go ahead. My relationship, when I ran for my life to the police station and he followed and all that kind of stuff, the police came and locked, buried, barricaded my house and told me, don't answer the door and don't bail him out because we're going to charge him and so on. Because he actually assaulted a police officer, a woman police officer coming in. Wow. Well, because they don't feel they're doing anything wrong. So to them, this is, you know, whatever. Anyway, the next day, this is true as I sit here, <laughs> I'm sitting having my coffee and you know that police knock on your door boom 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 and I go to the door and the same cop who barricaded my house is standing there and he said I told you not to come and bail him out I didn't and then we both realized that in that nanosecond that his girlfriend came to bail him out oh the cop he the officer felt so bad he said I swear she's your twin Gee, look. Wow. <laughs> so I found out in that short time because we got married in October and that I ran in February just after Valentine's Day that he had a girlfriend all along and she was actually pregnant. Unbelievable. Jeez. So how so we've talked about we've talked about how to spot narcissism or narcissistic relationships. So how do you so we have a, a couple of tips on temp, tips on <laughs> Um, confidence building, success building, but how do you get out of that relationship? Is how it- do you get out? Yeah. You step into that place of courage mm. and you leave. And narcissists are typically 99% of them are not violent. They're going to use all of the, the psychological things that they can use on you to keep you there. And think about it from their perspective. They've got you trained. They've got you where they want you. They can cheat on you. They can have another girlfriend. They can do whatever they want. And you're never going to say boo squat. They're not, you're not going to say what? I'm loving the Canadian colloquialism. You're not going to say what? (laughs) Boo squat. What's that? Well, boo (laughs) as in Halloween, boo. And squat (laughs) means nothing in Canada. Diddly squat, we see. Squat. (laughs) Okay. What? You're never going to say anything. You're not yeah, going to say boo squat. <laughs> I've got a whole I'll translate via Scotland. I'll translate for you. <laughs> well, wow. we're kind of from Scotland and came here, so I think we have some of the stuff. So anyway, you're not going to say anything. You're not going to reprimand them. So he's right. got the best life in the world. And if you just sit back and recognize that you are helping to co-create this perfect life for him by not standing up for yourself, you start to recognize that you have to take back your power and your value and step into that courage and leave. And are you going to cry? You betcha. Are you going to be angry? You betcha. But as time goes on, you're going to heal and you're going to start to see what else is possible for you. It's yeah. not about leaving and being stoic and never crying and saying, oh, well, it was a bad part of my life. Yeah, you're probably going to have a breakdown because a narcissist treats you like a goddess on the outside. Yeah. You know, but on the inside, they're destroying you. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, so when I was um, dating the guy, it, I couldn't ask for if I asked for what I wanted like he was really like after the beginning would really push me away and and it was like he had to work all the time and he started a new job and it was too hard and finally it was to the point where he couldn't find 30 minutes to 45 minutes a month to spend with me and and I and if I complained about it then he would you know like I would tell the people in the office well you know I want to ask him if we can go to lunch today but I'm afraid to you know, afraid of what's going to, you know, I'm afraid of what he's going to say or how he's going to react. So it was this constant every week. Am I going to see him this week? Am I not going to see him this week? Um, and if I, and when I finally pushed back and said, I have to have more than this in the relationship, um, you know, that's when 
I guess he saw that it wasn't going to go the way he wanted. Because I think we 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 just want to hold on to that that elusive feeling, that feeling of adoration, that feeling of you know love or all that that they give you in the beginning. You want to hold on to that, so you keep doing what they want you to do. But you you may never get that back because that's not who they really are. Um, no, that's yeah. that's just an actor at the beginning of the play. Oh, so sad. And if and so you know if you if you're in that relationship that that you don't have any choices and you don't have a voice and, and, you know, if you say you can't disagree, you can't, you can't have your own, um, you know, you can't have your own opinion. You can't, um, you feel afraid to share your thoughts, your feelings, whether it's narcissistic or not, it's not a good relationship. I mean, it's, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, I mean, that that's not the kind of relationship you want to be in. You want to be in a relationship that, that you can have give and take, that, you know, like I said before, that you can have a choice. And so, Susan, how do you work with people that, um, you know, I was going to refer you to that woman the other day, and I actually gave her your name, but she said, well, I've been working for, with somebody for a year and a half already. And I'm like, oh, wow, I wish that I could have referred you to Susan first. But anyway, she said, I've already got <laughs> You know, I've got somebody I've, you know, I've been working with them for a really long time because I was so messed up. And um, but how do you how do you work with people that that want to leave or or, you know, depending on where they pardon me or have left and are feeling that pain and need help? Um, I, I start off. Uh, I have like a foundational toolkit that I share with them. And the very first thing that we do is we go through an exercise that I call raw, which is a rage and weep because they need to get that out. It's been suppressed for so long mm -hmm. and they're so confused about what they're feeling that to actually get mad at him is a struggle because they don't want to get mad at him. To actually cry for what they've given up is a struggle for them. So we start there and we start with um, journaling about what came out, what thoughts came out. Now, a lot of women get stuck in the revenge scenario. So we work through that. They get angry. <clears throat> they want to have revenge. So we have to we have to step through that because it's really not a healthy place to be. But I start them off by letting them know all of your emotions that you've been suppressing need to come out because getting to that place of letting go begins there. And you need to, and if you want to yell at me, if you want to tell, tell me off, go for it. But you need to let that out. So that's where we start. And then we start with success journaling. Because I want them to recognize that every day of their life, whether they're going to the grocery store on their own, providing for their children, cooking the meals, doing all of those things, putting, filling out the rental application for a brand new home, these are all successes and that's for their confidence to build that. And then we start to talk about value, their personal mm. network, what their value is to themselves. And that is where the real energy and movement starts to come. That's where you find out what happened in their childhood, where they start to open up about things. And sometimes it's an aha moment and there's no blaming your parents. This is not going back to your parents and saying, oh, you nasty people, you did this to me. Because a lot of times it's done inadvertently. It's uh -huh. not even on purpose. It's done inadvertently. I had a client just recently who was the oldest daughter and her little brother was born severely disabled. So she... Her mother's attention was taken for that child. And of course, in that day and age, father didn't really get involved in ch uh, children's lives. And she was told by her mom constantly, be quiet, your brother's sleeping. And of course, her mother was exhausted with this disabled brother. Wow. So she lost her voice. So she continuously gets into bad relationships because as soon as somebody says to her, be quiet, she models being a child. Mm. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So it's there, not that there, go ahead. It's not that her mother did it on purpose. It was circumstances that led to that. So we model that behavior that we've been taught. Yeah. So Susan, how can people find you if they want to know more or they want to work on their relationship issues? They can find me at www.susanball.ca or on Facebook. I have a group called Free from Toxic Love oh, and wow. I have a Facebook page. So yeah, join me. And Allison, where can people find you? They can find me here every Tuesday with you. <laughs> Apart from that, <laughs> you can find me at alisonreiner.com um, or on PPC.
I've got a Facebook group which is loved again and forever, slightly from the other side, but you know, we, <laughs> we work through exactly the same uh, scenarios as, uh, as Susan. But you know, when you were talking, Susan, I, I had this vision. I was told that I had to write um, all my heart and all my anger and all my resentments. I could not think of one. I couldn't think of one. I spent months. I kept going and checking the dictionary to find out what the word resentment meant. And it didn't mean anything to me because every time I felt that, I would make a, a justification. I would say, oh, poor mum, because. So every time mm-hmm. I had that feeling coming up, I found an excuse for her. And it took me such a long time to get it. Of course, when it does, it's like a volcano. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's difficult even to, to unplug that because it's, we push it down so firmly. So yeah, that, that came up for me. I thought I'd, I'd share before we, we go. We've run over ages today. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's, there's lots to talk about. Yeah. We, I'll have to come back. I'll have yeah, to come back. for sure. Yeah, for sure. So well, I'm going to be doing weekly lives talking about all of this stuff. Yeah, that's so. great. Yeah. So you can find um, us all on Project Positive Change. And um, thank you guys for being here today. And um, I'm going to try not to feel too ashamed. Oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm not going to pound any uh, salt. Um, <laughs> love that. So well, are you going to do salt, boo squat? Boo squatting. <laughs> I've learned some stuff today. And then Allison said something earlier. that I, What did you say, Allison? Fox. She was Fox. 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 She was Fox. And I was like, what the heck is Fox mean? <laughs> I love Foxes. Anyway, so... You can just come back. We'll be here next Tuesday. I'm not sure who our guest is next Tuesday, but we'll be back. Next next Tuesday, we've got Josie again. We're talking about getting prepared for For the holidays. For the the holidays. holidays. Yeah. Yeah. Getting prepared for the holidays. That's a good one. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, Susan, Allison. You guys have a good day. You too. too. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.